Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Going to talk about one of my favorite cartoonists today, Alex Toth. Before we do, Ed, how about some Red Room updates? Red Room, the anti-social network, is out on the stands as we speak. Murder on the dark web for fun and profit. Looks nice. Even the color scheme kind of fits perfectly, Ed. But I assure you, Alex Toth would not dig this comic, <laughs> man. Look at that carnage. Uh, this is selling out fast, man. Just just had a signing and sold tons of comics. Uh, got word from retailers across the country that they sold out their stock and they're putting in reorders. So uh, this is a popular one. Thanks to the Kayfabe audience for making it so. But we don't rest on our laurels here at the Cartoonist Kayfabe Compound. The next round of Red Room Comics is going to start coming out in December. Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number one. So talk to your comic shop. Order that comic. You could pre-order it at the Fantagraphics website. You can read the first issue on my Patreon. All those links are on my link tree in the description below this video. Jimmy, what do you have? I have patreon.com slash jimrug where you can download out of print zines and mini comics and you can see original art, uh, scripts, process for how I make comics. I make like Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive or The Plain Janes, Octobriana and much more. And uh, speaking of Plain Janes, 500 pages of outlaw high school artists who start doing public art around their town and cause all kind of problems for uh, for all the residents, including themselves, in this little town. This is the perfect book for the upcoming holiday season for the young adult reader in your life, including you. And uh, you can get that wherever books are sold. So pick that up now and uh, be a hit at the holiday. Genius Illustrated is the one we're going to be checking yes, out today. Yes, we're going to check this one out. But uh, this is part of a trilogy of books that Dean Mullaney and Bruce Canwell published with IDW that are fantastic. Um, these two books cover basically his, his career. Um, you know, so up to about 1960 here for the first volume and then 1960 to pretty much to his death. And then the cartoon art of Alex Toth being the centerpiece, you know, everybody knows him for his great cartoon imagery. Um, chances are we're going to do all these. But uh, yeah, like they're, they're just fantastic. I had dinner with Dean Mullaney a couple years ago and we were talking about these books and the uh, Noel Sickles book. And I was just praising them and, and telling him how much I loved them. And he made a comment about how like that's like four of his five favorite books that he's been involved with. <laughs> but really masterful. You know, they started this out, it was going to be one volume, and it expanded to these three volumes. And there's actually a fourth book that is kind of the same format, same publishers, Mulaney, everybody involved. So in a weird way, there are actually four of these things now. Um, but I think they're the best snapshot of Alex Toth that you're going to find, because they are such a wide survey of everything that he's done, very prolific artist. And um, like I said, I hope we dive into all of them because they are some of my favorite books on uh, comics art. So today we're going to focus on Genius Illustrated. Uh, you know, again, the, the work from the last three decades of his life, pretty much. And um, to me, really, that's my favorite stuff of his. It's where he gets into his, you know, he, he's good his whole career. But I feel like he levels up around 1950 or so. And at that point forward, it's like, just start studying Alex Toe. Yeah, man. Let's, let's crack this open. Part artist edition, part monograph. I mean, completely a monograph. Uh, great scans of original artwork. Uh, we're going to see some repeat offenders. Like, we didn't do an episode on that genius uh, animated book, but we definitely did various episodes on some of the contents of this uh, book right here. This is the kind of stuff you would see in... Uh, like towards the end of his life where he's just do, you know doodling sketching and this stuff will get reproduced in various books um you know i think it's pretty well known but man i love seeing it you know like the kind of pencil sketches and we'll gloss over some of this stuff because it's it's a huge book so um we're going to focus on the art and comics but there is background on his life and his in his personal life you'll see some photographs of uh, him and his family and, and talk about kind of where he was at these different stages in his career um, on a personal level uh, production drawings for uh, Angry Red Planet. Does a lot of film work, of course, you're going to see. This is interesting. This is At Ease number 1, Sponsored Comics. Sponsored Comics was like an advertising comics firm. So a lot of these comics in the beginning, that's what they are. And it's interesting because you get paid a lot better if your comics go through an advertising firm as opposed to if they're going through a comics publisher. You get paid better if it goes... <clears throat> if you get paid anywhere... But the industry of comic books. That's right. <laughs> Everybody appreciates the cartoonist talent, except for the comic book publishers. Yes. But it's uh, a lot of um, kind of film stuff. You know, Dragnet proposal for Dell that didn't go. But man, how good does that look for a proposal? Oh, I know. 
Everything's beautiful. Um, several of these things are going to be from that sponsored comic thing, though. This is a, an oil company that's trying to sell boron. When you see this, though, like it's a little uninspired. You could tell that he's not quite so engaged with this kind of material. Much rather be drawing Errol Flynn. Much rather be drawing Earl Flynn than anything, I think. Uh, we'll see some, some of that stuff. I wonder about this stuff, too, though, if it's designed to be for non-comics readers, where it's like, it's just straightforward. You know, there's no frills, no tricks. Um, but that's his style, and that, <laughs> we know his style, and that looks pretty quick. This is uh, Fleetway, UK publisher Fleetway. So, you know, he's living in California at this time. He'd probably, you know, maybe sworn off DC or Marvel or something. And uh, just getting work wherever you can find it. It's this kind of stuff right here, man, where it's, this is a, we've seen enough Bonanza or John Wayne movies to not have to see the wood paneling that builds these little rickety town centers and stuff. Uh, and he doesn't have to draw it all. Like, this is what I'm talking about when I say stuff like, you know, what would Alex Toth do? Because you and I would not, have the confidence to draw it just black abyss with with these with these specific windows we would have every piece of uh the okay corral this is a disney publication for color you can see uh really interesting marks to me in this top panel too where it is just almost nothing the, the marks that he's making to show like the buttes and the landscape behind him really simplified there's going to be um hopefully i'll catch it but going through this volume and prep he does the thing that we talk about Manuela doing, where it's yeah. like you do foreground, background, middle ground, and you do it in black and white look somehow. At the, look at the cover. Look at the front cover. It's It's got that thing, where it's the black is on the white, and the black is on the white, and he's making sure to just break up those those shapes like that. Yeah, a master of that. A master of the black and white. And there'll be some very clear examples, you know, even right here where you're getting like the black silhouette of the window frames as being your, uh, your middle ground, you know, separating a whole nother scene. Reminds me of like Orson Welles camera shots, you know, like they used to shoot that stuff with just real depth of field of like, I don't know, maybe you're showing 50 feet of, of depth in some of those shots. I don't see it very often now, but, uh, you know, figuring that stuff out like on the page and Toth was as good at it as anybody. I, I don't, also don't know if I'll, I'll catch it when we get there, man, but uh, his correspondence with others is something that's mentioned, and it's a very legendary thing. Uh, people, you know, sh post and share their correspondence with Alex Toth because you're going to get, like, a sublimely lettered postcard or something back, but there's one in here that... This is from the silhouette zine. This is a panel I, <laughs> I used in my silhouette zine. talks about uh, his his um, correspondence with Milk Kniff in, like, the 60s or late period stuff, and Alex Toth is like a, a huge fan of Kniff, you know, sort of got into yeah, of comics like from from Kniff and is basically trying to convince Milk Kniff to like go back to his 1930s style. <laughs> and and Kniff basically tapping him on the head like, oh, you're a good boy. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different uh, a different stratosphere of, of cartooning success to be to be offering that. Um I held on here because this is a an adult magazine. You know, you can see it's very lurid. Uh, outside of what you think of as Alex Toth, you know, he, I think this might be the only piece he did for like an adult kind of magazine. But the guy who did this, he started an agency to find work for fellow pulp, pulp artists in North Hollywood, in his North Hollywood neighborhood. Like how many freaking artists are living in this neighborhood that he's going to start an agency? But the guy, uh, Milt Loro is um, the, the guy... He goes on to become what they call the, uh, in 1960s, the world's richest pornographer, is what Reader's Digest called this guy, um, doing these kind of like men's magazine type stuff. That's wild stuff, man. It's, it's crazy to think that there is like a whole art market where, you know, you could produce this kind of material, sell this through adult bookstores and things, say in the 50s and 60s, and it was this lucrative, like different market. It reminds me of Eric Stanton. Mm -hmm. because he was doing like mail order stuff you know like the key was sell as many of these as you can without drawing attention to yourself right you know so it's interesting because it's like really the underbelly of comics in that there were people that produced a lot of work and sold a lot of work and it is not part of comics history uh, anywhere so except at my house like i'm aware of some of these things and, and you know they're certainly on my radar because it's still comics you know in the case of eric stanton like he's working next to Steve Ditko, you know, they go to school together. They, yeah. they share studio space. This is a Twilight Zone story. I love it because of the bright colors next to his blacks. And this is where I really think like your flat colors 
black is a flat color. Yeah. You know, the way this stuff is used and printed and everything. Just great comic shorthand, too. Have a blonde, have a brunette. You're not going to confuse the two. Yeah, and then these are always fun where it's almost like miniature. You know, the, the gimmick is that the characters are uh, toys in, in some giant's uh, playset. Love that one uh, Twilight Zone episode, man, with the, with, a, with a clown and the soldier and the ballerina. They say that's what, that's kind of what that story is. Yeah. You know, it's, it's probably almost certainly based on that. I always forget that Eclipso is an Alex Toth uh, design. Yeah, and even with this kind of like relatively simple page, you still get an interesting, a pretty interesting panel here on the on the Ferris wheel chance to do his silhouettes in the background what do you think alex toth thought of bart sears eclipso <laughs> wonder if there's any correspondence for that <laughs> bart sears is like who who's that yeah at this point i guess back to work in uh in, you know dc comics doing some of their uh some of their anthology comics 1963 the date on these so here we get into something fun this is how to murder your wife the um the the movie the jack lemon movie and toth is the guy it's the character's a cartoonist in the movie. Toth is the guy that was tasked with creating the comic strips for the actor's character in the movie. Uh, famously, I think, walked off set because he wasn't getting paid enough, but did produce some of this stuff first. I mean, let's call back to our episodes, man. Let's <laughs> let's serve the Kayfabe channel. Go to the Jeff Darrow shoot interview. He specifically talks about it. Like, it was conversations with, with Jeff where Toth is like, you're friends with Mobius, right? He's uh, he's He's doing work for Disney. Like, what's he, what did he get paid on Tron, Jeff Darrow says, and then <laughs> fucking Alex Toth just slams, slams his it. hand on the... He's out. <laughs> yeah, and he leaves the room. Um, these are really good. Toth never did a, uh, like, a daily comic strip, so that's what you're getting here is, like, what a Toth daily might look like. So many good panels, like, sprinkled throughout just a couple, you know, 12 of these strips, but really awesome. And then, like, some of this is promo work for the uh for the movie and i've never seen how to murder your wife i actually was going to watch it this week and, and time just got away from me from what i understand and i don't know if it's in here but like i don't think somebody said that it's a different artist whose stuff shows up because uh, because the deal didn't go through yeah like i said i believe he walked off set during production so uh yeah maybe they needed more work than than uh, he was able to contribute to it but look at that i mean that's a pretty animated piece of toth you don't see that too often. Even the giant, like, scrum of characters. Yeah. These are really good. It's so disappointing whenever you see this and think, like, never got a daily strip out of him. Right. Would have been wild. Um, as I mentioned, this is covering, like, the last couple decades of his life, so it does touch briefly on his animation work because he's doing he's doing a lot of work all at the same time. He's, he's known for this kind of stuff, right? But... There's your evolution of Space Ghost. When you... S first, first sketch to... Uh, you know, what we know of Space goes. There are, like, Bruce Tim conversations where, and this is a guy, you know, who's who's been in animation for 30, 40 years. He said that, like, like Toth, for as kind of, like, like you know, spare in a few lines that you see, like, in any of his illustrations, it's actually not really good to animate that, that kind of stuff, the way he builds it, because it's too nuanced. In terms of figure work, you can't yes. figure out where the bends are. And uh, a lot of the people who do in-betweens, that's the cog in the wheel kind of guy. So they don't know about the collarbone lifting when you lift the arm and things like right. that. So you, like, Bruce Tim had to evolve beyond the, the toth part to sell it to, you know, the more rank and file mm -hmm you know, in between job guys. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. I mean, these things are all masterful. Like, and again, the, the animated book has hundreds of these. Yeah. They're amazing to look at, very instructive for an artist, but I can see how most artists would not be able to keep up with them. And you could always see also... I like his color work. You see a few yeah. examples of that throughout, and that reminds me of like heavy metal or something. When you see the actual animation, like you can see the parts that they use and reuse it over a million times over, and it's like, okay, that, they got the good animator to like translate this piece and they're just going to use this run cycle of johnny quest like as much as possible yeah i'm sure i'm sure that's how it works you know not unlike old comic shops right where like the new guys ink in background details and uh your ace is on those figures see like a lot of this is like salesmanship and you know you got to have the cork board and, and present it to the uh to the bosses and you you get it when you see this stuff because you know if i was the executive i'm like yeah, I'm not buying this one. <laughs> like, I'm not buying this one. Like, you don't, I, you don't want Planet of the Dogs? Yeah, like that one's like, 
try, try again, man. I like this one because you get to see a little bit of his pencil marks. Most of these originals are so clean, it looks like he's drawing straight in ink. So anything that shows like, oh, that's how he does his lettering, I, I appreciate. I started drawing better fat pads on my hands, uh, looking at Toth and stuff. Fat pads a fun, a fun way to describe that. I know exactly what you mean, and I appreciate it whenever I see it done well. Yeah. Uh, and it's not that easy. Yeah. Because it's weight. It's, it's like mass and weight exactly, and shape. Exactly, yeah. Hard things to draw, especially uh, in the middle of a hand. Yeah. And it's there. Like, once you see somebody draw it, it's... I've been drawing better knuckles lately, too. So, like I said, you know, there is these are biographies. So, you, you do get uh, background on his family and his family life, his personal life, and all that stuff. Uh, I'm less interested in that for the sake of this show. So, I'm going to gloss over it, but pick up this book and read it. You know, like probably a good library, you could find a copy of this. Big Daddy Roth. Like, I think some of these things <clears throat> might have been drawn by, by Robert Williams. I'm sure uh, Kay Faber in the comment section will correct us if, uh, if I'm wrong about that. But I like the idea of a juxtaposition between. Alex Toth, uh, you know, the stodgy, you know, it's like Mad Men meets yes. the 1960s kind of energy. These things are just gorgeous. And, you know, this gets into like his hot rod art, which is in that one for the road. Some of my favorite stuff of his, but it just feels like I think he had a lot of creative freedom on this stuff. I don't think it paid well. So you're, you're dashing them out, but it's a chance for him to just do those compositions. Like, look at how the sky turns into the water. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. It's just incredible. It's like panel after panel is just him getting to play with these formal compositional this shit is super fun you know they're they're wild even the choice to make those guys the color of the water i was just thinking that same thing looking at this one like what are brilliant. you what are you telling us like the focal point is the splash exactly right the water is kind of the hero here and those previous pages you get to appreciate you know like the four color reproduction of the original art but still you can see all of the interesting composition that he's putting down and a relatively simple page, six panel grids, but oh man, the hot rods. What a great silhouette. Always fun lettering. These are awesome. And, uh, you know, we did do a video on this stuff, so definitely check that one out because for my money, it's some of my favorite of his where he just gets into the more cartoony side of the comics art, but still part of his uh, great compositions and great eye. Putting used to the duo shade on, on these boards right here. That's really fun. Fun to see him playing with that. There's another one that's pretty good for uh, like uh, ink washes, all the different textures for his lettering. Incredible lettering. Incredible lettering. Yeah, it's a giant part of the compositions. Um, even like the one page strip, again, in that uh, one for the road. But those things are great because they're like from one to I think six pages long. So yeah. it's just these short, almost design problems. And then like spot illustrations, uh, this from Motor Trend magazine. So he's doing comics, animation, movie work, and illustration work. Just a full illustrator. Pretty know. much at the same time. I think a lot of people, like, uh, you know, you would make your income that way. A lot of these guys. It's just like if you were on that <clears throat> hamster wheel of Marvel DC, there is no time to do anything else but that, you know, 22-page comic that you're working on. Yeah, it's, it's the difference in uh, a freelancer if you're living on the, on the West Coast where, you know, you're not going in every day or a couple days a week to turn in an assignment and get a new one. Um, you know, a little bit longer lead time, I suppose. This is for uh, Teen Magazine. I like the the matchup of, like, the typeset lettering with it. And um, some interesting stuff in these, too. There's a couple of examples of this, almost like sci-fi, where your your teen protagonist is passing through the instant Vogue machine, select the fashion, and coming out as, like, some kind of sci-fi fashion idea. Pretty wild to see him on this stuff. He invented the uh, Guardian Angels of the <laughs> New York subway system. Super team. Vince Coletta on inks over top I, of I him. I was going to say, this is, this is somebody's doing something there. These are both Vince Coletta. This is uh, the X-Men, X-Men 12. So I think it's layouts Kirby, then like pencils Toth, and then Coletta on top. Once again, Jimmy, we got to call out. We got an episode about this, man. Whenever we see a piece, man, we got to call out that episode because we got a nice, a substantial back catalog of uh, Alex Toth. This is dives. another one that I wonder if he has uh, notations on, like the Toth fans. They have a lot of his <laughs> writing about different uh, how his work was printed or collaboration. And I wonder, like, what he's thinking whenever you know Coletta's uh, inks come back. And there's there's some fussiness in that inking. There's fussiness, but it's not a bad job. Mm -mm. No. You wouldn't recognize it as Toth, per se. This is his first Warren-published work. Amazing to me the, the way the heavy line works for, like, a gun. Yeah, he'll do some real subtle stuff with highlights uh, as we move forward and see more of these guns and stuff. Like, 
in a very few lines, he can really sell you on the metal texture yeah. and the volume. Yeah, like this is the stuff where, you know, like pause the video and take a close look at how simple these drawings look. Because to me, it's, it's a perfect tank, a perfect boat, a perfect machine gun. But you start looking at the drawing and that's the magician part of Toth. Yeah, like I've been uh, paying a lot more attention in my drawing, uh, seeing it in uh, John Romita Jr. And like a lot of people were... were uh, really thinking about the 3D of like how the, the foot works and you mm -hmm. see how it wraps around and it it totally sells you on the shapes that make up that foot. It's not just this like flat shape. You'll see people, they have that tendency to just draw that shape and not think about the contour of it. Yeah, he's really good with that. And uh, this whole page, just a showcase of textures, you know, like water into splashing water into smoke the mud and stuff, it's really impressive, man. The, Smoke is not easy to draw, water's not easy to draw, and he makes it look easy. The game was never the same after you saw Jack Davis do his muddy that's GI true. boots. Yeah, that's a really clean boot. That's a clean boot, man. As soon as that touches dirt, then then you got uh, Jack Davis. Bring in Jack Davis. In. This is a pretty fun piece here. This is a splash page of survival from Blazing Combat, and uh, it was a false start. So we're gonna turn the page and show you what he ended up with, but, but take a snapshot in your mind of what the start was because he goes in a very, very different direction. You know, I'm so stark compared to what he started with. Yeah. And this whole story is reproduced, I think of David Mazzucchelli, uh, Big Man, yeah. which we have a video on, um, but it feels like this is the exact formula for Big Man aesthetically. And uh, even Batman Year One, I see a lot of Batman Year One, like when Batman's trapped in that building at the end of issue two. Oh yeah. It feels like this is it. Yeah. Really impressive. You know, the gloves even remind me. There's so much of this that just feels like Mazzucchelli has to know this story inside and out, right? <laughs> when, when you get these big heads, like with the, with the black around it, it really feels constricted. He's just a great cartoonist. You know, like being able to make a panel like this work there's almost nothing in that panel, and yet it reads perfect. I know. Like, would you have the confidence to not draw a face there and just draw these kind not of Not in a million blocks? years. This also reminds me, like, sometimes you'll see somebody do really good layouts, like yeah. tight and how... D Dave Gibbons, you know, where he's spotting his blacks and stuff in the layouts. It's pretty close to something like this, where it's like all the information's there. You can certainly see a couple of guys sitting around a fire and a figure approaching. Like, it all reads. Yeah. There's no fuss over, like, some fine line or anything, but... Again, with the David Mazzucchelli, you think about like a dumb line and it's, look at the line work where, where he's actually using lines. Like it doesn't look like he's trying to do some sexy, th thin, thick, thin attention to the line work. Yeah. And I, I mean, at a certain point now, now this looks, you know, I'm seeing brushes and stuff like that. But I mean, he moves to a place of just these flare pens and stuff where he's not concerned with uh, feathering. And noteworthy too. This is his lettering. Like, oh, yeah. He, this, this page is all toast. Yeah. Cool to see him doing uh, doing the the washes. Um, there's a collection of his war and work, and that's a book worthy of uh, of looking for. And I, I think that one might be still available. It's the maybe. one that's still in front. Like that's, it's great. That's it's a really tragedy. good book. Like uh, you can you can get that one no problem. But like it's it's the it's the Bernie and it's the yeah. Steve Ditko and it's the Richard Corbin that you're not going to find. But the Toth is still there because people just they're just not hip enough. Well, you know, it's a pretty good book. Like, Toth is hard to find. His stuff goes out of print, and uh, and that's a nice collection of Toth work. If you're watching this at home and looking for one, um, that's a really good collection. You should breeze through this stuff, because we, sh we should check out... Yeah, uh, fair enough. Well, I say that, and then we get to this these pages, and this it looks better here than in the, the, uh, the Dark Horse <clears throat> books. Yeah, and I don't know if this one's in there. This is Blazing Combat, so it's worn, but I don't know if it's in the Dark I, Horse I, collection. I do think it is, yeah. Okay. This is fantastic. So one thing that we know he loves, uh, you know, Bravo for Adventure shows that. But like these kind of uh, dogfight, you know, biplanes and triplanes and stuff. And uh, I think he has a lot of fun with this. Look at this guy just getting strafed with the machine gun fire. <laughs> Here's a piece that's almost impossible to believe. They show him practicing, target practicing, shooting cans out of the air. So like bullet holes in these cans. Imagine being tasked with drawing that in a script. Right. It seems impossible, but, you know, again, figuring out where can he put these blacks that he's known for and to uh, really make these compositions pop. Can you imagine having to draw this shit panel after panel, these fucking airplanes, panel after panel and many different views? Quit comics. I'm done. 
yeah, this would not be for me, but... There's no Google SketchUp here for you to trace. You if, know what if, I'm saying? Uh, you know, if Scorchy Smith is your favorite comic and, and Noel Sickle's your favorite cartoonist, maybe this is what you've been training for your whole life because it sure looks like it. I love all of these aerial shots that show, like, the, the texture for the farmlands yeah. around the little city. It's amazing. Yeah. But impossible... How much do we talk about perspective? You know, like figure out your horizon line, get your lines all converging to the same points. And then you go up in the air and it's like, now you want to throw all that out and just be disorienting. <laughs> These are beautiful though. Like it really feels like he's, he's uh, enjoyed that story. And now we come to this Hot Wheels number five. And uh, this is um, another one. Well, production art. So you see his, his rough sketches and then finished art. And I assume he's doing the finished piece, like the, the paint color here. Because it still looks like his art, and uh, that's my impression. Even the lettering down here, I for sure, to be yeah. his. So it's kind of fun whenever you see him doing color art. Because I always think of him as being a master of black and white, but you know, master of line art too. Like there's no shading in these things, and yet they still have that same kind of perfect composition. Even attention to like some interior design. You know, it's not a generic lamp, right? But uh, he did these Hot Wheels series for DC Comics that are kind of hard to come by i actually don't own a single copy of them i got a couple i man coverless. i never see them anywhere you, you know coverless is probably the way to to find them yeah and and i i have a, a scoop for you but we'll, we'll save it off the air sounds good yeah if you, if you know anything about these yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> give me the the first uh, first crack at it but they reprint the case of the curious classic which um story and art by toth which is pretty good you know like one thing he complains about in this book is that he never he never wrote his own material for the most part he just something he didn't feel comfortable or confident or, or good at doing the writing part. And in a way, it, I think it holds him back for how we think of him as, or how he's considered historically as a great cartoonist. Yeah. Because the material seldom matched his artistic ability. And, uh, you know, if you're writing yourself, it, it's one of the arguments to write your own material for that reason. But they reprint the full series, the full story here. It's like 20 pages. It's all in this eight panel grid with the big black borders. Think of stray bullets, right? Like, oh, this yeah. Is, this is oh, totally yeah. a stray bullets kind of... Um, uh, storytelling here on display but it's about this old time car and throughout the process you know a gangster runs it off the road it sinks in a swamp somebody else gets hold of it years later to restore it all right the the foreground background middle ground black in your foreground black in your background white in the middle ground it's a spotlight right you know your, your middle ground subject is in a spotlight is basically how this is working and he does it a few times so Hopefully I'll catch a couple more and show that off. But it's incredible how he's able to build that depth. And I think it's a similar thing to how Mike Mignola does it. You know, yeah. if you've only got two colors to work with, your foreground background kind of has to be the same color. Right. So pretty great to see him, you know, cutting loose and doing this story. And, and it's fun. It's almost a detective story as like once this car gets restored, then the, uh, the gangsters start to show up. And I love these two panels. They're so cinematic, like this car on the horizon, just watching, watching him testing out this uh, restored car. And then it's gone. And then doing chase scenes. Not easy. No, not at all. You could do a very short list of uh, good car sequences in a comic book. This is pretty good, too. Like this four panel of opening the garage door and bringing the light in. You know, like it's it's works so well in the in the final one where you have like that whole door is opened up now. And it's clear. It's a respect of the reader for them to like, they know what that is. Give yeah. him just enough. Super dynamic of uh, shooting, creating some cover for himself. Great body language. And then you got the stage left guns coming out. Yep, just the, just enough. You know, it's all this stuff is, like you say, respect for the reader. It's just enough information to see what's going on. That's Toth. It does look like him. He drew himself in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pay attention, man. There's a couple pictures of him. That looks exactly like him. <laughs> This was listed as an IDW artist edition. Like, I think it was going to be one of those portfolio pieces. Mm. I don't think it was ever released. I, I did a lot of looking for it whenever I saw it listed. And then this is the story redrawn for um, foreign publications. So, like, the main character is drawn over. And I think Toth drew over it for a French edition because of the Hot Wheels license. Right. That's a weird caveat to kind of, you know, like... What a weird license, Hot Wheels. You know, it's like Transformers or something for the 70s. I was actually reading about that stuff in like, uh, you know, Matchbox versus Hot Wheels and, and the whole, you know, battle and what made the, the first one popular and how they had the Monopoly for a while. It's 
It's real interesting stuff. They do a good job with all the reprints too. You know, it's a very nice uncoated paper. It's heavy, so nothing's bleeding through. This is a beautiful art book, you it know, is. and 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 it's a fraction of the the cost of like a Rizzoli, you know, New York City published art book. Although it might not be now. I feel like it's out of print now, so you're buying it on the aftermarket. <laughs> It'll uh, some, catch up. I, I think just the, the animated one is the real hard one to find. The yeah. other ones are cover price or less. Uh, this is pretty neat. So this is a DC War comic, White Devil, Yellow Devil. And I think a page of this is available at the Billy Ireland. I feel like we've looked at a page of this. I think it's from this story. But uh, what happens is he sends the story off and it's published. So these are like reproductions of the published printed pieces. Whenever it comes back, he starts redrawing it, uh, parts of it. So he's adding more ink and shadows, um, silhouetting figures more. And you can kind of see it like if you memorize this panel here, you'll see this figure is, is one of the ones that gets um, a lot more ink added to them. But man, how much is he doing in black and white? Oh, yeah. Another example of, uh, you know, black silhouette foreground, white in the middle, and then your jungle is your black background. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that's your formula for it. But here's that figure, you know, you can see it's completely blacked out compared to, uh, it's small there, but you can see that's much more of like the shadows of the branches and stuff on there. And apparently whenever he saw it, he felt like it needed, it should have been more like this. So he's touching up his original art. <laughs> Bit of a perfectionist. He seems restless, you know, and, and, he, and he makes that mistake that one can make where you put your standards on other people right. and, then, and then that makes for bad interpersonal connections. I love this one too, because it's more of the airplanes that, you know, he loves these war stories. And uh, now we've moved into like world war two, the different airplanes, like the Mustangs and stuff, but it looks completely different. These bombers look so different than like the biplanes that we saw in that previous Warren story. And then the bombs are just dashed lines coming off, you know, these background bombers. Yeah. It's incredible stuff. Really playing with space in terms of like his lettering and captions and stuff. This feels like standard, like this is DC composition, you know, DC stacks of panels. I, I wonder how much editorially was, was put on, on him here because we've seen so much stuff of him just like pacing out his own works, but this is very Kaniger war book yeah. pacing. Yeah, completely. Uh, Kaniger's name, I think top, top on um, page one. Uh, I love this field of like the, the fuel drums and that truck. Pretty, pretty inventive uh, layout. And, you know, we always talk about like, make sure the characters are doing something. And here they are rolling like the fuel drums down the, the truck. Pretty small detail on a page, but keeping everybody busy and active. These are just gorgeous. Yeah. Just black Dude loves, dots, loves planes. Some directional devices. Oh, yeah. And how does that shit reprint, huh? Yeah, I'm sure there's some stuff lost in uh, in printing translation, no doubt about it. Again, with the animation, because, you know, this stuff's all happening simultaneously. You know, this is early 70s now at this point, uh, what you're seeing here. Presentation art as well as, like, the model sheets that he's famous for. Storyboards. You know what I thought of when I saw this is how much it looks like those monitor or television panels oh, that yeah. we would see in Chaikin and Miller and, and really everybody uses them at this point but it just feels like that. Specifically these ones make me think of uh, a couple issues of Grendel mm -hmm. that uh, Matt Wagner did like totally. after the Panda Brothers yep. uh, in the first run like maybe issues like 11 uh, like 13 14 something like that. Yeah. Uh he because he goes hard he it's it's 20 panel pages those, or something. Those books are worth looking at they too are. sometime. I mean, those the are really OGs, interesting. Man. But yeah, you're right. And it's cool to see like how the, the stuff, the storytelling in these are really good. Yeah. If, if you stop and pay attention to them and see the shots that he's choosing and suggesting and stuff. And we looked at uh, the backup of Super Friends because Toth does the cover and the end pages. But then what he actually gets into, what we looked at is uh, how to animate the Toth way. Original art for this. What is going on here, Ed? I don't see a pencil line. I, know. I don't see like any kind no of like Ames lettering guy. No indication that he's lettering on some kind of a, a a base there. It has to be. This has to be light boxed, right? Oh, you know what? I didn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, that would make sense. That would make perfect sense. Let Let me just say this here. Uh, we did the Super Friends episode. People were clamoring. They were going to eBay. They were going to Amazon trying to find suitable copies of that Super Friends uh, Treasury Edition pretty expensive like the ones that are were, were cheap 
were very banged up to the point that maybe you don't want it in your house, honestly. They look moldy yeah. and things. So for your bottom dollar, get this book, uh, if it's still in print, if it's still easily available, so that you, you could get your hands on that piece that we were talking about in that episode and so much more. Th th this entire piece is here. It's, yeah, it's exactly. reprinted completely, uh, you know, in its original art form. They're gorgeous. Like like this kind of thing. This is your stray bullets eight panel grid. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just alternating text and image. I can't believe how nice this stuff looks. Yeah. I think uh, th this I, is what made me think he, he must have he must have light boxed it. Because you know, I mean, he's working in animation. That's part of the animator's desk. Right. Um it's so clean, like, right? He's, yeah. he's gotta be doing that. I I'm mad at him if he can letter like this without guides. <laughs> I think, uh, I'm not 100% positive, but there's an Alex Toth documentary, and they do show off. I th one guy owns the complete story, and it might be John Hitchcock. That would make sense. But it's beautiful, and it, you know, the whole thing here, all 10 pages, and you know, even the playful, like having the last bit of line of text follow him off the page. So much better than any of it needs to be. Yeah. You know, really the mark of, I think, a great cartoonist is, is taking the stuff that could be pedestrian. That could have been typeset. For all we know, that was just like... Hey, we have five extra pages. Hey, Alex, like, oh, uh, you know, you we, here's your page rate. Like, do something with that. This is an unproduced live action film bit. This fascinates me because I'm wondering if he saw some Jean Giraud blueberry. There's a very French it does look quality like to this line work uh, that you would see in Jean Giraud blueberry comics. I never made that connection, and it, wow. You feel it, it does right? look like it. As soon as you say it, it looks like that. The hat, everything, the the face, like all the marks on the face, look like it. Yeah, so you know that could be That's an indicator that he's looking at stuff. Um, there's a lot of this kind of stuff too. You know, the illustration type art, which I enjoy seeing. This is um, Armed Forces Press. He did a lot of work for. These are neat. They're almost like your daily strips or something, where it's a little strip that's addressing various things. Um, you know, crime pre prevention, signs of alcoholism. Uh, Adult comics, you know, these would be like a Will Eisner kind of uh, yeah. service comics, yeah. which are pretty neat. Except for this one, which is part of that series, but this is like about like radio signals coming out of the moon and shit. Like hamburger, <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> um, odds and ends again. Like guy worked for every publisher, whatever popped up. You know, there. This is. Thrilling Adventures 2, which is kind of an interesting comic magazine and probably worth looking at, has Neil Adams and like all these A-listers in it. Uh, Hot Stuff. This is the new Scorpion, which would have been an Atlas title, and it was rejected, so it wasn't printed there and ended up ended up uh, elsewhere. Um, I really like that piece. That mask and the way his hat and suit and everything, to me, that's a, that's a pretty good-looking character. It's, how do you reject that? You know what I mean? Like, get that editor on the, uh, on the horn, because I think he made a big mistake somewhere. They made a, a lot of bad choices there. I'm not positive what this is. It's Howard Hawks, The Thing from Another World, but it's the film journal number six. So, like, I was looking at it and trying to figure out, like, did he do, like, uh, storyboards for a credit sequence in that? Or is this just, was he commissioned to illustrate this for a magazine it article? Looks, it looks real quick. It looks like he was watching that shit up on the screen and had to, like, just capture in the moment, like, a court mm -hmm. courtroom artist what the heck he was seeing up there. It looks neat. Man, talk about looking neat. Yeah. This is a Charlton Bullseye piece. Now, Jimmy, is this lack of archival quality? Was this black? Like, it looks very red. I think it's red. Uh, yeah. There's another there, There's another story in here where he does this with red lettering, and I've seen some older comics that do it. He experimented with all these pens and everything. And, you know, red would photograph, like, in photography, red's the same as black. Oh, uh, I see. So, I don't know why you would do red and not black, but... Well, I think we should unpack this specific uh, s story uh, as its own 15-minuter. Yes. It's, it's, it's reprinted in that uh, be best Batman comics ever told. Yeah, that's a standout. You know, I, I think of this in, in uh, Black Canary as like those those 70s-era DC superhero comics of his as being really exceptional, and this one this one's a nice one. That's so weird. Somebody sent me a compilation of like all of his DC short story stuff, and curse you DC Comics for not thinking that a collection of his comics would sell but I love it like even the lettering the guys just nailing it romance comics this is Vince Coletta inking here and uh, this is Doug Wildey and Frank Giacoa inks wow 
Doug Wildy worked with on uh, um, Johnny Quest. Yeah, sure. And and I think they had worked on something before, like the year before, you know, like animation seasonal work. Yeah. Where the roles had been switched. You know, like Doug Wildy was kind of show running or designing or whatever. Did episodes about this. Yes. It's it's a bummer that this is a photocopy, but man, I love these title pages. I think they're so sharp. And again, so much more than you need to do. You know, her laying there with a gun in the foreground would have been all you needed. And then you hand it to Toth and it's like, you can do more than that. One of three unpublished covers Toth drew for the cover of Witching Hour number one. I love those characters too. They got resurrected in the uh, the Neil Gaiman mm-hmm. Sandmans and uh, really were used to great effect there. Had Had actually no idea that they existed for as long as they had, you know. Yeah, a lot of this stuff just wasn't around whenever I was a kid reading comics. You know, it wasn't being reprinted. It wasn't being published new. It was just, like, erased. You know, it could have been 100 years old for all I knew. You find that stuff. Like, that's the stuff that would be so easy to find in flea markets. And it would get to the point where it becomes white noise. Like, yeah. do I need to see another issue of Haunt of Mystery or, or how, you know, House of Mystery or uh, any of those? It's funny how taste changes because, like, now I'm more interested in those than I would be whatever I was, you know, Batman or something I would have been picking up. Thousand percent because you're getting Alex Nino in there, uh, Alex Toth, Frank usually. Thorne. There's a lot of good good artists would come through those and do interesting looking work. You know, they weren't they weren't beholden to staying on model or anything. Um, Bookworm. This is a great story, of course, because uh, it was redrawn by or, or drawn again by someone else because Toth quit. Because he had to deal with Charlton, he was the highest paid artist, found out Neil Adams was getting a higher page rate, that was it. Dude. He, he walked. NWO, Favored Nations contracts, man. Exactly. This is that red lettering, though, that I mentioned. And I mean, clearly, this is red. I, I don't think that's a... Uh... Once again, we, we have an episode about this, man, comparing the Toth version with the rank-and-file Charlton comic version. And you, you don't see stuff like this translucent figures in black and white ink uh in that other version i mean you do but you don't see it like that no for sure it's a beautiful you know another complete story reprinted from the originals but i mean the the red has to be like from a reproduction point of view same as black and it just the markers came in red i guess yeah and now you're starting to get into like late 70s and you start to see some weirder stuff this is an eerie story i think this is reprinted in that uh dark horse collection of his warren work but getting into like alien stuff, a partially completed story. This is one that he uh, he abandons, but takes the character into another story. I like seeing it partially inked. You can see some of the pencil mark. You do see some of the drawing and stuff here, yeah. And the uh, the lettering under underneath, and a few lines at least to keep that lettering straight. I guess. <laughs> World War Two. Uh, or World War One biplanes next to your uh, your aliens. I love it, man. There was there was a great issue of uh, Incredible Science Fantasy, that's like the all UFO uh, issue, man, and it's all that that sort of juxtaposition of of uh, pilots and UFOs. I have no idea what these two pages are. He's inking Kirby here in uh, in seventy nine. I don't know what this is. He's ghosting for Russ Manning mm. on a daily or something. Once again, another West Coast guy. Like this is this is dope. Like when you read the text, he's talking about how um, Kirby would like apply fixative to his panels, and then and then I guess maybe somebody bought this or something and like wanted Toth to ink it to have that tandem. So he's not happy with his ink job. And I think somewhere around here is the Kniff correspondence where, Mm -hmm. where Toth is telling uh, his hero that he needs to draw like he used to. Yeah. Which every artist wants to hear. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, the Kniff stuff's interesting because it was like Kniff and Noel Sickles, you know, working side by side for years. And, uh, I mean, those guys were huge for, like, generations, you know, and, of course, Toth learning at, at their knees, uh, you know, via newspaper prints, not that he was in the studio with them or anything. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, it's part of their legacy is Alex Toth. The Bravo for Adventure Artist Edition, once again, that's something that at least was available very readily, very easily. Uh, people were not, you know, seeking that thing out. We did an episode on that. I don't know if that changed the game. But uh, all of this material is in that Bravo for Adventure Artist Edition, printed to scale, with a lot of extra supplemental material, some some uh, thumbnail stuff. Um, get a glimpse into the way he he constructed and wrote these comics. 
amazing textbook in comic book making. Yeah, that stuff is so. We're we're. I feel like we're so lucky to live in an era where that kind of thing is being produced. Absolutely. Um, some pinups and stuff. You know, some of the correspondence. Um, this is a, an odd one. I don't. I don't know what this was for either. This it, is uh, maybe a maybe a military SSAM number 30, 1981. But uh, you see this is his art sprinkled throughout and then you get to see it as like a six panel grid of the uh, the artwork that is dropped in almost like uh, headlines in each article in the previous one. And this is a, uh, a rejected uh, a, re a rejected piece about uh, soldiers tell us from the trenches. And you can see why maybe um, the army wouldn't want this to run. <laughs> it's a pretty dark take on uh, war comics. <laughs> Storyboards for commercials. I think for uh, anim animatronic, uh, you know, like make make the quick run the storyboard An quickly. Animatic, animatic, animatic. Yeah. Right. Uh, so doing some of that. Oh, an off character Spider Man, wrong costume. He they would do that shit. This is neat because you have like Marvel and DC characters. This was to prove that he could do superheroes to to some advertising company or storyboard company that he was working for. I was kind of I thought it was neat like who gets picked. You know the the Hulk and uh, Spider Man being the representatives of Marvel at the time. Yeah, and it makes sense. It's like, got a big body, got a strong body, got a lanky one, and then, you know, I could draw girls too. Yeah, draw the monster, draw the superhero archetypes, and draw the girls. Torpedo, another video that we have on here, that first Torpedo collection, where he did the first uh, two chapters and then kind of bowed out because didn't like the uh, didn't like the the material the tone was a little bit too harsh for him but they highlight like he had rewritten the words for this and then whenever it was printed the original script is what they went with yeah. you know like they relettered it to uh, to follow uh, Abuli, the Spanish uh, creator this is pretty good I always associate this with Ditko for some reason and I think that it appeared in um, Bop I think had a Ditko story in it and that's why I link it but this is like his story um, you know, dedicated to Wally Wood and Russ Manning. But I feel like it could be dedicated to any of these guys like a Ditko or any of those artists that just, the industry just didn't seem to, to treat them well. Right. You know, and they were different. They were guys who had that vision and had that unique kind of style. So dedicated to them. And uh, one of the more unusual Crumb story, or uh, Toth stories. Thundar, Barbarian, character designs for that. Designed the three main characters, and then uh, Kirby takes over. Ruby Blue Spears. This is great. You know, correspondence you mentioned, Ed. This one is to uh, young Ken Stacy, 1984, and it's talking about his ideas on composition. This is, this is magnificent stuff. Like, in a way, this is almost worth the price of the book just to get him to weigh in on composition. And uh, most of it is you create something different, and that's where your eye's going to go. So that's your, your point of interest. But he also talks about layouts where he's doing these silhouettes. And it's like, make it work in silhouette because it's just all shapes. Right. Pretty interesting. I can't imagine drawing. The, like, this is so different than how I draw. Yeah. Yeah. And you see, you see those artists that do that stuff. And we're so preoccupied with getting the drapery on that arm right. And it's like, what's the point of it if the reader can't even follow the narrative? Yeah, it's... Like I say, very insightful to read a, a guy like him, you know, weighing in on, on these uh, these pieces. This is a promo comic giveaway. Again, you know, working for wherever he could find work. Ooh la la. I don't know this story at all. It's from Dragon's Teeth number one. Not something I'm familiar with, but like a complete story reprinted here. So I'm grateful for that because it's new to me. He stayed interesting to me clear up to the end. Oh, sure. You know, it, it's these look less labored over, but I feel like it's distilling down his ideas of composition and storytelling, too. When we start getting here, man, you could, you could imagine Jaime mm -hmm. discovering this guy's work. Yeah, definitely some overlap there. Stylistically, you know, I don't know whether they're thinking the same way or looking back at like the original at stuff, but... Like, look at that, man. Totally. Jaime draws that face. Yeah. This is a pretty good one for showing the uh, duo shade boards. This yeah. is a, uh, um, 
you know, like a dot pattern. Yeah. But you get to see him painting this, and they make a note that the the when it was printed, a lot of this stuff just didn't translate. Yeah. So this is a chance to kind of see the nuance of some of his uh, tonal work. This is the kind of boards that uh, Chaikin would use for American Flag. Probably the pebble texture would be a little bit further apart so that it would print nice. But I can imagine that dark, man, like that dark uh, chemical would damn near be black. Man, some beautiful compositions here too. You know, like like that that ocean, that big two thirds of the panel being ocean, but also where your text box is going to go. Really strong. I kind of like whenever he's doing these eight panel grids, and it's mm -hmm. all uniform size panels. But then, like, what can you do within those panels? Uh, a lot of John Hitchcock stuff here, a guy that he corresponded with for years and years of his life, color guides that he did for his story. Look how simple that is, just yellow and blue, you know, essentially two colors. Warm and cool, light and dark, like everything you need is there. One of his, uh, I believe his wife's favorite drawing of his, and this was for like a Native American um, Bureau of Indian Affairs he created in the 70s. So again, doing work wherever he could find work. Johnny Hazard covers. There's some cool stuff here where you get to see like some of his heroes that he's doing covers for. Gasoline Alley, Terry and the Pirates. Um, this is a cover I love that you find on Ace Comics. Uh, very briefly published these comics in the 80s. Yeah. Um, but a cool cover there too. And in color. Yeah, this one was floating around and people are like, it's not Walton Skeezix. It's, you know, this little girl character. Funny, like if he had the wrong character or something. Right. And then figure drawing. I always like to see this. Let's yes. you know that these guys that seem like they draw almost like right from God himself or something, they're working on it though. They are, man. But look at these lines, dude. Like he's putting them down. There's not underdrawing. That's really. true. Like he's capturing that gesture. Man, it feels like he's doing like holding that pencil sideways too and really getting that. You see those guys do that. Like like uh do you do you ever draw that way with that side of the pencil stuff? Like? Almost never. Yeah. I might... don't even have pencils that work well that way. You know, like if you're doing a mechanical pencil, you're not gonna be able to do this kind of stuff. I see uh, JRJR draw that way. I yeah. see John Byrne draw that way. It's like uh th this looks to be that way. When, it's a it's a pleasure looking at these though. These look like a guy that just draws the hell out of stuff. When you go to life drawing class you see a lot of the people that you're sitting there with drawing that way. The nice thing with drawing that way is uh, it's you take your wrist out of it. Yeah. Like that's how you end up drawing like, you know, full arm, kind of moving your, your full arm around and stuff. I had this book as a, as a kid. Yeah, I got an image uh, reprint mm -hmm. of, the, of the strips, man. Very good. It's good to, like whenever you could get like a whole chunk of Alex Toth, man, just consider that a textbook. It was so hard to find. Like, you would just buy whatever... I would buy whatever I'd find. Yeah. You know, if I found a Zorro collection, it was like, that's what I'm getting. That's... Yeah. And, and excited for it. You know, sure. like, there's a lot of good stuff in there. A lot of these pinups, they've been printed, you know, in different places over, over the years. A gouache piece. I didn't know what this was. It reminds me of, like, Doug Wowdy's Rio, but it, it's not listed as anything. It seems like it was just a something he was playing with. And then, like, I think this might be his last uh, published work or yeah. his last Batman. Mark Chiarello, man, hit him up. Hey, man, give us a story, Batman Black and White. I don't have a story for you, but I'll do a little uh, doodle. Probably one of the few Toth pieces I bought, like, you know, day of release. I'm uh, sure. You know, and then you get to study that and think about, like, what he's doing with those different grays. Super good. Oh, yeah, incredible. Like, like the, the reductive stuff, I, I ain't gonna lie. Frank Miller primed the pump for me. Like I didn't really see that that often mm -hmm. before I saw Frank Miller, so I was I was attracted to that. I think Miller is is kind of what pointed me to Toth for the same reasons. Like Miller's the stuff that I found first that I was able to access, and clearly he's he's uh, applying the same lessons. Yeah, you know the same ideas of how to use black and whites and stuff. Famous image you see reprinted a lot. Yeah, this Fox piece. He had done a couple of Fox stories. Yeah. Uh, Sometime around in the 80s. Red in, uh, Circle comics mm -hmm. or Red something? Circle, yeah. They would be like backups, and they were wonderful. And that same deal, like those were comics I could get of his, uh, but they look really good, and I think they're drawn in markers or something, big fat lines. That big, that big fine liner for sure. Like this kind of stuff. That looks like your side of your pencil. Oh, yeah. And there's a John Hitchcock book that reprints a lot of those kind of doodles because they would, I think, send postcards back and forth. And a lot of those postcards would just be all drawn up with uh, Toth sketches. So that's a nice book, too, if you can find it. Um, one, one of the other cool bits to this at the end, if you just want to go there, is uh, bibliography. Yes. Beginning in 63, so I'm assuming like, the, the other books have like the, the earlier they bibliographies. Do, yeah. 
Because, I mean, he, he did some EC Comics, you know? He was working under Harvey Kurtzman. I always love this cover, the uh, Frisky Frolics. That's one that I find. The 80s stuff you find. Yeah. You know, like you'll find in those dollar bins and stuff. And and you know what? I, I, I got to have maybe four or five copies yeah. of this. Every time <laughs> I, I see it. I bought more than one of those. Every time I see it, it's such an attractive cover. Then you crack it open. It's like, eh, okay. Yeah. Because it's not all tote. It's exactly. not tote. In fact, that might be the only piece of tote. Taps might be in there. Taps might be in there. Yeah, that yeah. might be where Taps... It might be a reprint of Taps in that one. And uh, Great American Comics, uh, you know, some of the stuff that they publish. Uh, I mean, mostly this is Dean Mullaney's wing, exactly. wing of IDW. Yeah, Dean Mullaney from, from Eclipse Comics and then moving on to uh, moving on to this stuff. Dean and Ma- uh, Scorchy Smith, No Sickles. This is probably another one that we'll, we'll get on here at some point. Dean Mullaney, publisher of Eclipse Comics with intern named Ted Adams. Flip the script over a couple of years. Publisher Ted Adams with... Uh, One's a copacetic comics purchase. Hey man, check check at the back of my of my gimmicks, man. <laughs> there you go, man. Out of print, see, paying the cost. Pay the cost to be the boss. So here we go, forty four, forty four. Look at that. These two are uh, these two are your pairs. But track them down, you know. Like if you're looking for Toth, they did Mulaney. You know, tip of the hat to Dean Mulaney. I thank him whenever I see him for making these books because it's hard to find good Toth work. A yeah. lot of it's out of print. These are spectacular. Whenever we take a look. At Alexander Toth's artwork, I got to get back to the boards, Jimmy. K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, man? Join me on patreoncom slash jimrug where you can download out of print zines and mini comics. Got about a dozen of those up there right now. You can see my original art, scripts, layouts, how I make the comics I make, like Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive, The Plain Janes, Octobriana, and more at patreoncom slash jimrug. And many thanks to the people who have been subscribing. My numbers have been going up, and uh, I really appreciate that. So thank you. Super cool, man. Red Room, uh, the anti social network trade paperback in stores today 20 some pages away from finishing the next book collection jimmy uh murder on the dark web for fun and profit is the name of the game you can get it at your local comic shop get it asap if you see it you cannot take for granted that it's going to be on the stands much longer because amazon bought a big grip of them man uh i'm serializing the next round of red room comics red room trigger warning is going to start coming out in december go to your comic shop get that put on your pull list all these links for pre-orders to subscribe to the patreon read the comics ahead of time Available in uh, the link tree in the description below this video. What else do we have? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. I right, give them those merchandise, man. We're going to be on our way. Make more comics.